All right, so now we're officially live. And you'll be able to see, you know, when viewers start showing up kind of up here in the corner and then the comments will show up on the, uh, the side there if anybody has any questions. Um, but usually we just sort of launch into it and then uh, this gets uploaded onto YouTube uh, afterward so that people can continue to watch and enjoy. Okay. All right. So with that, we'll begin. Uh, welcome to the season finale of Winter Views Series 2, Episode 11. I'm your host, Catherine Silva, Cat for short, and tonight we have Stephanie Parent talking to us about sex in horror. How are you this evening? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Of course, I'm very excited. This is a subject that um, I think is can can be a sensitive one, but also it's like it's a very um, just. I think it's something that is totally changing as far mm -hmm. as uh, the horror genre goes at the moment. So it's really cool to have your take on it. Um, do you want to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm from Baltimore and I'm back in Baltimore now. Um, I grew up here, was kind of like a artsy, introverted child who read a lot and was very into like fairy tales, including the Dark Sides fairy tales and fantasy and kind of losing myself in my head type stuff. Um, and then I moved to Los Angeles for a while, I was kind of inspired by Francesca Leah Block's books to move there, if anybody's read those. Um, again, fantasy, magical realism, but some of her books do, I feel, touch on horror a bit. Um, and studied writing there, um, sort of dabbled in trying to be a writer always, but I kind of fell into a different lifestyle. I started working at a dungeon, um, so basically became like a sex worker. Um, I was a submissive first and then eventually a switch, meaning like I did both submissive and dominant sessions. Most people, when they think of working in a dungeon, picture dominatrix. So I was never quite a dominatrix, but when I did the dominant sessions, that's kind of what, what it is. Okay. Um, so I did that for a long time and then eventually kind of wanted to go back to writing um, and write about my experience in different ways. Um, so I started out like writing a lot of nonfiction pieces, trying to write a memoir, stuff like that. And eventually I had that idea to write a ghost story set at the dungeon. And that sort of led me into this horror community. And I always was interested in horror. And I would say through the lens of fairy tales, like I was drawn to darker fairy tales like Bluebeard or the robber's bride group, bride, the robber bridegroom or things like that that really are horror stories, even though they're called fairy tales. So and gothic, gothic ghost story, that type of thing. So that was kind of my entry into the horror. And then I found this community and during the pandemic really and got really excited by it um, and started writing a horror novel basically set in a dungeon. So kind of combining my interest in sex work and BDSM with horror. And mm -hmm. now the, that book is coming out. It's called The Briars, it's coming out in May. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just really entered into this world and I'm writing more horror and Feel like this is where I'm gonna fit for a while. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much me. And I'm back in, I came back to Baltimore during the pandemic and now I'm here pretty much for good, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know anything else that I should add to that or? No, I, I think that's a really good entry. Um, all I have to say is that I've heard really good things about the Briar so far. Um, I know Antonia, uh, Rachel Ward last week mentioned your book on our interview and said really good. Um, Rob, I just, finished I just finished reading Marionette, so, which is also really, really good. There you go. Um, Rob Atone mentioned that your book was really good. So it's getting some really good early reviews. Um, for, for those of you that don't know, it's being released by Cemetery Gates, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and it's going to be awesome. You should get it. Uh, so let's, let's start the, the evening with getting into our topic, um, sex and horror. Um, sex is known for its prevalence in horror. They kind of just go together. Um, what are your thoughts on sex and horror, um, how it's used, uh, and the importance of it to the genre? So I think that 
sex and horror are naturally kind of intertwined, at least in me in popular media, um, books, movies, things like that, because they're both kind of speak to our baser emotions, not meaning our lesser emotions, but our instincts, our gut, our deepest like primal feelings that we sometimes feel that we can't control. I think both the horror, the fear and desire are like two sides of that coin. So they kind of naturally go together. And in fact, I was watching kind of a silly horror movie. I don't know if you've seen it called Better Watch Out. I watched it on Christmas. It's a Christmas. I'm going to try not to ruin it if you've never seen it, but it's set at Christmas and there's a babysitter and there's like a teenage boy who kind of wants to seduce his his babysitter and so he has an idea to scare her and he says he's telling his friend he's like i read that you know the same chemicals that cause somebody to have desire and to have an orgasm are the same chemicals that come up brain chemicals that come up when you're really scared so he has this idea that he's gonna scare her to Mm. turn her on and Ah. i do think that is true that some of those chemicals are you know if not exactly the same they're very interconnected and certainly violence and sex are very interconnected and like the idea of an orgasm being called the little death you know like they call it in le petit mort in france um and you know sex can be a very violent act in both um pleasurable and non-pleasurable ways and it's a very physical act it's very rooted in the body as are is you know fear and violence and horror so i feel that they naturally go together that way um they're also kind of genres that may be looked down upon by maybe more of a like literary or elite viewpoint that these are more you know pulpy or grindhouse or mm-hmm. that type of thing um so they go together that way well and i think that really in the past, you know, I think our culture has actually always been more scared of sex than horror, I would say, or more scared of sex than violence. Like if you look back through, you know, the history of like TV and movies and what was allowed to be shown, like the amount of violence shown on TV far out outweighs the amount of like naked bodies or sex or things like that. So a lot of times horror movies were the only way you could really see sex in a mainstream movie for like a long time. And it, it makes sense that they kind of go together that way. It's like the the forbidden, the the things we don't like to talk about, the things that scare us. Desire is scary. Um, you know, we can't really control who we're desired to, who, who we're attracted to, who we feel desire for. And um, desire makes us do, you know, foolish things or put ourselves in dangerous situations um, that we might not otherwise be in. And yeah, so I feel like they kind of naturally go together in that way. Like, I think it would be mm-hmm. hard to write a horror, write a horror or, or have a horror movie that didn't have any somewhat sexual aspect or touch on sex in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as sex as symbolism goes, um, you know, in, in a lot of the old time slasher movies, um, mm-hmm it was seen as a harbinger of doom for yes. <laughs> the characters um, going along with that, like fear of sex and um, uh, fear of the erotic. And um, it's, it's also been sort of seen as the symbolic to uh, like primal instinct, things like Dracula and, mm-hmm. yeah. um, you know, uh, I think the other one that always comes to mind is um Oh, it's a werewolf film, and the name just popped out of my head. Um, is it American Werewolf in that one? No. Um, oh, Ginger Snaps. Ginger Snaps. Yes. yes, that's that's the one. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Like a, a lot of time, and it's even going even further back before movies, but like around the time when Dracula was written, and just the gothic and the hor- the gothic horror. For people who were writing literature, it was horror was a safer way to write about sex because you can read Dracula, you can read the penetration and the, you know, drinking of the blood is all being Mm -hmm. sex. You can read it that way. Um, But it was actually safer to, to write about this monstrous creature doing this monstrous thing than to just talk about like a, you know, a very um, lusty man having sex with lots of women (laughs) or raping them. You could probably interpret it that way too. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and um, so that, that symbolism has changed um, quite a bit. I mean, it, it, I think it's still similar in a few places, but um, but lately I feel like we're in the middle of a horror renaissance where we're seeing a lot more positive uh, portrayals of sex in horror. Um, what are your thoughts on how this has kind of changed? Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually started quite a while ago, like, even back with the scream, I think was, and you mentioned that when your questions to me, I think yeah. is, is like, kind of a commentary on that. And um, kind of a, a um, I wouldn't say it's quite at that point, it's not quite flipping the script yet, but it's getting there. And then when we even things like Jennifer's body, which I guess is pretty, it sounds like 10 years old now. <laughs> Yeah, God. Uh, yeah, because that was where it really and, and and I mean, people did not understand that movie, unfortunately, when it came out and didn't really understand what it was trying to do. But that was really very much like a positive portrayal of a woman like you woman using her sexuality to like reclaim herself and her identity. Um, but people just didn't unfortunately see it that way at the time, I don't think. Yeah. And there was a book that came out that also, I think, unfortunately, got a lot of bad reviews. I think came out in the 2000s or 2010s, a book called Innocence by Jane Mendelssohn. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of it? I have. Um, it was a literary book, but also a horror book. And I love this book. And this book really just flipped the whole idea of the final girl being the virgin on mm -hmm. its head. Um, it followed kind of a slasher. It, it was a really cool book. Like it actually referenced so many different types of horror movies, lots of slashers, but also like various baby and lots of things but basically kind of followed the, the slasher plot where the main character was in high school and she realized her friends were getting murdered and then she actually realized that she I'm gonna spoil it but hopefully it's okay yeah, it's um she realized that she had to have sex with her boyfriend in order to survive Oh, okay. Because the virgins were being targeted in this movie. So it yeah. turned out like, can I really spoil it? Like, because it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty interesting. So it was her stepmother was afraid of getting older. So her stepmother was like killing virginal young mm. girls to like get their beauty and their yeah. life. Gotcha. So she, she realized that once she had sex, she wouldn't be a target for her stepmother anymore. So it really worked in all those fairy tale themes too and all that. Mm -hmm. Um you know, because we can even go back to something like Snow White and see that same theme, yeah. of, like the evil stepmother trying to take the young know, woman's youth and beauty. But anyway, that so that idea of trying to subvert the the idea that you had to stay a virgin to survive, I think, has been just growing over the past um, decade, probably. You know, mm -hmm. and yeah, at this point, I I feel like it's pretty um, established. Um, I was watching X last night. I was trying to figure out how, because I wanted to talk about that. And have you seen that one? I haven't yet. It's it's definitely on my list of things to see. Um, I'm that trying to decide how it fits into this, because it's definitely in commentary with this kind of idea, because it's a movie about a group of pornographers who then get targeted by killers. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the first half of the movie feels very, very sex positive. Like they have discussions about how they want to live life on their terms and, you know, use their sexuality to make money and to have freedom and to enjoy themselves and all this. And then to try to not get too spoilery, but some of the people who've had sex do die and some don't. <laughs> so it's yeah. kind of, I feel like it's a little wishy-washy in the message. It's not, it's not a clear sub subversion, but it's getting there. Um, okay. Yeah. I don't know, have you seen any recently that you feel like are a very clear subversion of that idea of the virgin um, surviving? I mean, not, not really. I, I, I honestly, the only one that I could think of, God, <laughs> I don't, I haven't actually gotten a chance to watch a lot of horror a lot of the newer horror movies that have come out within the last year um and well i actually i think the menu is a yeah, really good I definitely one i want to talk about the menu at some point i don't know if it, yeah. it, it feels like it's at a slightly different because it's not a very sexual movie it's, it's not more about being a sex worker than about yeah sex, but 
Very, um, yeah. Very excited about that one. I watched that one recently too. Yeah, that one. And then the, I mean, I did watch the new, um, pin, I almost said the new pinhead, the new, um, <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Why is the name gone? Jesus. Is, Hellraiser? Um, is, it Hellraiser? is that right? Yes. No. The new Hellraiser. <laughs> Um, and I, I really liked that one just, um, because it did show a very, like, kind of messed up, um, really struggling heroine who, well, I don't want to spoil anything either, but, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, chose to go with somebody not necessarily virtuous, as yeah. their hero and um and really spun it well so yeah. another one um that i did watch was the most recent most recent season of american horror story um which is set in the gay community in the 1980s oh, okay. and with aids like aids is kind of the antagonist of the movie almost okay um, I mean, not movie, sorry, TV show. Um, that was interesting too, because basically a lot of, it, it's very, it's very um, masculine, very masculine tone to the, like almost all the main characters are men, but there's just a lot of like hard, violent BDSM type hmm. stuff in, in, in the show. And it's not villainized. It's not seen as something that like would cause somebody to, you know, deserve to be targeted by the killer um yeah. or something like that so it's really humanizing the men who did engage in that kind of sex and and showing that you know it wasn't their fault um mm -hmm. so that that's an interesting one too because yeah. you know that, that there was a lot of like at the time there was a lot of like oh you know it, it's their own fault for having unsafe sex we're not going to put money into aids research or, or care mm -hmm. about this population or that kind of thing so the whole show was kind of a critique of that and saying that like these people deserve the same treatment as any other humans you know and deserve yeah. to to have the right medical treatment and uh have their the science look actually look into what was happening to them rather than it being ignored at the time so that's a good one too too yeah that actually reminds me of um, the Midnight Club, which was on Netflix. Um, one of the characters that was, you know, at the house that was, you know, all the kids that were dying had AIDS. That was his, um, that was his illness. And we didn't get a second season of that because Netflix decided to cancel it. But um, Mike Flanagan had written this whole, like, this is what would have happened in season two. And that's one of the characters that would have survived because the medicine for AIDS was just sort of coming out and getting released. And so that was pretty awesome, too, was seeing that that character survived in spite of... Uh, yeah. So... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and then another one that came out somewhat recently was Cam. But again, I think that's more going towards sex work rather than sex. So I don't mm -hmm. know that one, but she's a she's a Cam girl, and she starts getting targeted. Um, I don't want to spoil it because it's a more recent movie, and it's got a cool kind okay. of interesting plot. But she basically like she doesn't back down from embracing her identity as a cam model and like using her sexuality and mm. being successful. And she, despite what happens during the movie, she continues to want to have that profession and nice. to like embrace her. Okay. So what's another one? Yeah. I was going to say, I haven't heard of that one. That would be yeah. If we do, if we veer into talking more about sex work, I definitely talk about it some more. It's on Netflix. It's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting movie. Okay. Um, so as far as um, the next question goes, um, which is, it's basically how you embrace um, writing about sex and sexuality in your own work, since mm -hmm. you happen to have uh, a very different outlook on it from a lot of other horror writers. Um, how how do you think that you approach it 
differently from other people. Um, yeah. So I think, think that I came to it first from wanting to write about my own experiences in doing BDSM professionally and in my personal life too. So I was writing about that first and then the horror element came in later. Okay. Um, so that's probably different than most most horror writers, but I did realize that horror is a really good way to write about <laughs> these things, especially BDSM, um, cause I have mixed feelings about BDSM. Like it was something that I've been drawn to from a very, very young age. Like I all had a lot of of fantasies that scared me. So there we go with like the, the you know, horror or fear and sex being intermingled um, that I didn't understand. I just had a lot of fantasies from when I was little about, you know, like being tied up, being hurt, stuff like that. And um, it's scary. And so one thing that one way that we deal with things that are scary is by exploring them in art and like imagining the positive or negative things that could happen. So I think that that's kind of what I started to do. And the horror naturally kind of, you know, fits in there. Um, I don't love personally to write erotica. Um, <laughs> when I was when I was um, editing books, I edited a lot of erotica and a lot of romance and I just, nothing against it at all. And I think anybody who can write good erotica is like the most amazing thing in the world. But personally, like I don't like reading things that are overly explicit for yeah. large periods of the time. Like I, it's just one of, the, it's the same thing that like, I don't like to read a lot of fight scenes. Like it's yeah. too, it's too uh, mechanical for me. Like I'd rather, leave more to the imagination. Mm -hmm. um, so I forgot where I was going this. So I don't want my, so I want to be able to write about these things without making it erotica. And I think horror can be a good way to do that um, because it's necessarily going to have this darker tone and maybe be more thought provoking in a way or more exploring a range of emotions. Like, mm -hmm. I, like I also think that I probably offer a somewhat more negative view of BDSM than many authors do these days. And mm -hmm. I understand why so many authors want to portray it very positively because Fifty Shades kind of like ruined everything <laughs> by showing <laughs> just BDSM as abuse and just getting everything wrong and just terrible. Yeah. So I understand that people want to, you know, course correct after that. Um, but I, I, and like, I still, you know, consider myself part of that world and still have these feelings but I also have gotten hurt through BDSM so I do think you know there are dangerous elements to it and negative sides to it and that's probably what I'm more naturally drawn to write about so that again works well with the horror and I think that whether BDSM is being done safely or not I think for a lot of people part of what is so attractive about it is that it's a way to, it's a way to, to um, experiment with something that really scares you. Mm -hmm. So like, if like with, for me, since I was little, I had fantasies of being like kidnapped and tied up and having bad things done to me. And obviously I don't actually want that, but why does this mm -hmm. thought keep coming into my head over and over when it's not something that I want? you know, and it's scary, but attractive at the same time. And then acting that out through BDSM role play is like a safe way to explore the feeling and maybe understand where it came from or try to get to some sort of catharsis. Now, if you're doing it with the wrong person without the right boundaries, it can get mm -hmm. very bad. And then people would say, well, that's not BDSM, that's just abuse, which may be true, but so I write about that too. So I write about kind of like all sides of it. Yeah. Um, and I think in that way, it does lend itself really well to, to horror, psychological horror. Cause it's kind of like, one of the ways I think about it too, is cause I also don't really like to watch a lot of porn or things like that. And I, I think that like the things that we can, and it's the same as with horror, like the things that you don't see, the things that are just somewhat implied and then you have to kind of use your imagination are so much more scary or erotic or fascinating yeah. or whatever they are than what's actually shown. If yeah. That makes sense. So, and that, that's kind of my approach to it all. Yeah. If that made I, any sense. <laughs> it did. And <laughs> I, I, for one, am, am also a person that like 
I'm I'm not really a fan of reading erotica. I don't need a play by play of every single thing that yeah. happens. <laughs> I really prefer just that that like I know good things are happening and there's like a um it's not uh it's not just like too much. Yeah. Um and that's how I like to write too. And um I think what's really cool about what you're doing is that you're not shying away from the frightening things, the, the true frightening things um, that have happened, because I know that that can be really hard to, to really write what you know when it is terrifying or um, it is bad, because you don't want to create more terrible portrayals um right. yeah i think both but, bsm and sex work like there's so many negative portrayals already that people are just scared to to add to the to that but then like portraying everything in a super positive light is not realistic either or really yeah yeah um so that's that's really cool and that's um that's Tell us a little bit more about your, um, about the Briars, about the, the book that's coming out. Okay. So it's basically very, very close to my real experience at the dungeon that I worked at. And while I was writing the book, so I wrote it during the pandemic, while I was writing it, the book, the dungeon closed. So permanently. So I felt mm -hmm. kind of better about like really just the layout is the same mm -hmm. from the clients and the people who work, obviously I changed names, but yeah. it's very, you know, similar to the real. And since it doesn't exist anymore, it feels a little safer to do that. Yeah. Um, but so when I worked at this dungeon, um, and I guess I could tell you a little bit too about what exactly a dungeon like this is, since most people probably don't know. So it was basically just like a house, like a little cottage and okay. um, it was open basically from 11 a.m. That's probably one of the things that surprised people. It was open during the day from 11 a.m. to like 10 p.m. every day. And you oh, would just work, okay. you would work a shift. And so this is one of the funny things though when I was writing the book. So I always worked day shifts because I took the bus and I didn't want to go at night. So like I always worked day shifts. So when I started writing the book, I just had everything happening during the day because that was when I was there. So that was what seemed natural to me. And then it occurred to me later, I was like, I probably should have put some of the more of this at night so it would be scarier <laughs> but I didn't but I was like oh well it was too late then I do have a couple like I have some scenes where they're like going up in the attic and those are at night like they stayed late till the dungeon closed to do it you know so it was okay. like yeah I did that. but anyway so it was open and you would just work a shift with like a bunch of other women and everyone had to start as a submissive so what that would mean is that like clients would come in and they would spank you or tie you up or do a role play like you were the naughty schoolgirl, or and that's in the book naughty school girl or naughty secretary or whatever it is mm -hmm. um and then there's no actual sex there were things skirting the lines of sex um but no actual sex but there were clients trying to break the rules all the time which comes up mm -hmm. in the a lot so you yeah. always start as a submissive and then you could become a switch and if you wanted to become a dom so that would mean you were just topping so the the men male it was pretty much all male clients male clients who would come in you would spank them you would tie them up mm -hmm. stuff like that that's what was going on. So this dungeon was started in the 1980s um, by a very, from all accounts, like very strong independent woman named Lady Lara. And she died in the 90s. And it was kind of said that her ghost haunted the dungeon. Okay. So I basically used that as it. So at first I thought, oh, that would be a cool short story. You know, write a short story set in the dungeon with a, this ghost haunting it. So, I basically just expanded it into a novel. Um, so I kind of use that. I changed the name. So it's not Lady Lara in the book. It's Lady Lilith, but it's kind of the same. So her ghost has been haunting the dungeon since she died. Um, but then in the book, you know, things start like so clearly something has changed because the, the ghost is getting violent when it never was before. <laughs> We're trying to figure out why. And then there's... Um, Two main characters that we follow so there's a dominatrix ruby and a submissive claire and we go back and forth between their viewpoints and it's it is definitely a horror novel but i would almost say it's not just a horror novel because it really goes into their pasts um 
like their experiences with sex work and with other types of work that brought them to the dungeon. And then it's also becomes a love story. So I feel like nice. it's a romance novel too, almost. <laughs> but uh, just all these things kind of meshing together. So that's kind of what the book is. And I also was um, inspired by a lot of folklore. Like I looked, I read a lot of folklore from a lot of different cultures when I was preparing to write the book and trying to get inspiration. Um, just across cultures, a lot of stories about young women who died tragically and came back as ghosts. And often this was in some way connected to their sexuality, like maybe they had an affair, um, they got pregnant out of wedlock, maybe they were abandoned by their husband-to-be and they were already pregnant, or they were something, something, some kind of deviant sexuality that led to them dying and coming back as violent ghosts. Okay. It's something that occurs across cultures and across time periods. So I thought that was interesting. So kind of, that kind of inspired the book too. Nice. Um, well, there's a comment from Linda Summersee who uh -huh. says, Briar sounds really good. So <laughs> there's hopefully somebody that's going to yeah. pick it up. <laughs> Thank um, you. I know I'm definitely going to pick it up because it sounds <laughs> incredible. Thank you. Um, are you, um, well, before I ask that question, um, and before we get into sort of our wrap up questions, let's talk about um, how sex work is depicted in mm -hmm. horror, because that's yeah. um, another, that is a, you know, different topic. Um, starting related. With, Somewhat related. Yeah, related. <laughs> um, starting with the menu, because that is uh, a very prominent movie right now. Uh, wherein yeah. the main character is uh, an es I would call her an escort. An escort, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so I think also very positively portrayed because there's not any sex in that movie at all. Um, yeah, she's not sexualized. Like she yeah. doesn't use her sexuality to try to get out of the situation. Yeah. Um, so more on that though. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I was, I just, I loved that movie and I would love to know if an actual escort was either consulted or was one of the screenwriters because it certainly seems like it. Um, it was just spot on into what it's like to do that job. Some of you understands that like an escort is not just somebody who has sex. There's somebody who gets to know their clients and to, to understand, to observe, their behavior and understand what makes them tick and know how to interact with them in order to keep themselves safe too. Because I mean, I think that there's a lot of comment in order to make money, because that's our job, but also in order to keep themselves safe. Because I think there is some commentary in this movie about like even a high end escort, you know, going to a very fancy restaurant in, in a beautiful dress, like it's a dangerous profession. And I feel like that is kind of an undercurrent in the movie because like, you know, she finds out partway through that her date took her there knowing that she was gonna die, mm -hmm. you know? And that's, and sex workers is one of the most dangerous professions in the world. Like the murder rate for sex workers, I think is like higher than any other profession. So I feel like it's a little bit of a commentary on that, even though, you know, obviously a crazy situation that's not what would normally happen but so there's that and then there's the fact that she uses her smarts and her intellect her bravery the skills that she learned from her job about observing people and figuring out what makes them tick and mm -hmm. that's what that's what she used to escape um so it's pretty amazing and i mean she's also like the only sympathetic character in the movie which yeah. is kind of amazing because usually the sex worker is not the sympathetic character and is probably one of the first to be killed off, you know? Um, so yeah, I thought, I thought it was amazing. What did you, what did you think? Yeah, I agreed. I mean, it just, it's, what's nice about it is that um, a lot of the time when sex workers are portrayed in horror, it is a very like cliche um, thing. They are over-sexualized. Um, they're not necessarily portrayed as being smart or clever. Um, and then they do often die very quickly. So, yeah, it is nice that this movie turned that around and decided to portray it in a very positive way. Um, the other and, movie that I was talking about, Cam, 
really does something very similar. Um, okay. Because in that movie, she well, she's a cam girl, but she someone kind of starts to take over her identity. Um, that one I would say is somewhat more sexual. Like it does show her being sexual, which is not necessarily a bad thing because that's also part of the job and it kind of embraces that as being a skill almost. Like she's very creative in the kind of scenarios that she comes up with that show her sexuality in different ways. But then she also, by the end of the movie, she really uses her intellect to get out of the situation. And then even after that, she chooses to stay as a cam girl. She's like, I like mm-hmm. this, this is fulfilling, this is what I want to do. Um, so it didn't like scare her off. So it's very similar, really. Cool. Yeah. And that one is on Netflix for yes. those of you that might've missed that. Um, anything, any other um, portrayals of sex in horror that that you think people should watch or read or? Well, we were talking about Marionette. So that is both yep. sex and sex work because um, the main character is a prostitute. So um yeah so that's by antonia and antonia rachel ward and it's 1800s right grants have you read it i haven't read it yet it's on my my tbr i think it's the 1800s but it's definitely the past and it's it's like kind of like moulin rouge era in france and um the main character cc she is a prostitute and she's very positively portrayed she's not portrayed as over sexualized it's just like, this is what I have to do to make a living. And it really is kind of a positive thing that she wants to be independent. She wants to go to the big city and make a living and make something better for herself rather than being stuck in the small town where she was from. And just Mm -hmm. at the time, you know, you selling sex was a way to do that. Um, But it also, some of the comments that other characters think or say like shows, it very clearly shows the, prejudice that sex workers received and still receive. So it does a good job of showing that. And then the other interesting thing about that book is how the sex is basically used as a vehicle for horror. Like, I don't think I've ever, maybe, you know, I'm thinking of another book that does something somewhat similar is Perfume by Patrick. Mm. So they both kind of like, like the, like sexual attraction, desire, become scary and dangerous in both of those books, which is not, Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it quite that way. So it's like, it's titillating, it it is sexy, but at the same time, it's very scary what's going on. Um, Okay. So I think that that's interesting and then speaks back to what we were talking about earlier about how closely related desire and fear are and that they involve so many of the same kind of emotions and brain chemicals Mm -hmm. and things of that nature, all kind of intertwined. I don't, have you read Perfume? I read it so long ago. I haven't, I haven't read it. Um, I feel so, like I may have seen like- you know, Yeah, there's a movie, movie, but I think it ends but... like gigantic kind of horrifying orgy <laughs> situation where everybody's like out of their minds. <laughs> yeah. And then um, in uh, Marionette, so like uh, the, it's, sort of speaks to feeling not in control of your own desire because there's kind of possession and people taking Mm -hmm. over other people's bodies and using sexual desire in order to do that, which is very scary. And then on a, it's kind of a bigger metaphor for what really does happen when you're maybe like very attracted to somebody in the early stages and you feel like you're not really in control of yourself. You can't control your Mm -hmm. thoughts or you might do something reckless, you know, I think that's a good one. That's very interesting. Yeah. I definitely do want to read it. Um, and um, another one that I will mention, I don't know if you've read it, is Waif by Sam Kolsnick. Yeah, one's on my list. Yeah. Um, that one's really good. And it deals a lot with, I mean, the, the beginning of the book deals a lot with this uh, woman who is kind of stuck in a relationship with her husband that is um she's unhappy um just really like kind of ends up um fantasizing about somebody that she sees uh and it it goes from there but it's it's the i think what spoke to me most about that book was just like the the feeling trapped 
yeah uh, in a in a relationship that you you know you're you're okay with it's it's a like it's just kind of like it is what it is but you desire so much more and you're afraid of taking those steps to make it so um and it's it's balanced really really well so i i do think that um definitely we'll check that one out it's been on my list for a long time <laughs> i just haven't gotten around to it yet i know there's a lot of really good books out there it's hard to yeah. uh, to figure out what to prioritize um do you have any current projects that you're working on that are uh that will sort of involve sex and horror um well i just finished a poetry collection that was like pretty much totally autobiographical and kind of about my experience at the dungeon and both like the semi-abusive bdsm relationship i was in at the same time I don't think it would be, and also some like kind of self-harm stuff going on too and OCD mm -hmm. stuff, lots going on. <laughs> but um, I don't know if it would be totally classified as horror. Definitely not yeah. like, not like a ghosts or, uh, or demons or murders type horror, but I mean, it's pretty dark. Um, so I'm trying yeah. to, I'm trying to find a publisher for that right now. Um, and then I had a lot of like short stories that are kind of like BDSM horror or sex work horror and I'm thinking about doing a collection. I just, I don't know if I'm gonna write more or that. I have like a lot that I've kind of started and haven't finished. I've kind of been, um, kind of had like some changes to my work situation. So like writing has been stalled <laughs> for the past <laughs> months. Um, so I'm kind of deciding whether to like continue with some of those or to start another book because I do think that I'm do better with full length like I get more inspired when I'm doing full length I kind of probably shouldn't say because I know you're not supposed to talk about projects before you really but but one idea that I have is that I think it would be interesting to do like an eyes wide shut type horror mm -hmm. okay. um, like something that took place you know over one night yeah kind of like mansion and sex workers there and yeah orgies or whatever and strange things going on <laughs> I think that could be yeah interesting. that'd be really cool yeah that might be my next project but we're probably pretty far away away from starting it because i am one of those people who doesn't want to start until i know that i'm gonna have a lot of time to work on it yeah no that's <laughs> that is smart um being somebody that has a million projects going and has no time uh yeah. <laughs> or at least time to think about it like, yeah kind of free brain space i've also been thinking about like trying to write a couple articles you know similar to what we were talking about like articles about sex workers and horror and stuff like that mm -hmm. do that like go towards some nonfiction a little bit i do have um so my memoir about working at the dungeon never really took off but i have like kind of the best pieces from it the best mm -hmm. parts of it are like a chat book and that's going to come out next year um cool dan Chian, not sure if I'm saying that right. I just realized I've never heard it said out loud. Stanchion Press. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that too. Cool. Very cool. Um, and yeah, there's also see like some similar characters from the buyer. You can see the kind of the similarity to some of the right. people who are in the memoir, <laughs> the creative nonfiction. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to say there's there's a lot of room for nonfiction horror articles right now. Um, and I think that's something that I really haven't dabbled um, too heavily in. But uh, but I think that is just it's such a great way to um, not not just to be scared, really, but just to like learn about what other people have experienced. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. definitely publish some of those. Um, I guess I don't really have any other questions uh, for you at this point, but um, does anybody watching, which I assume is probably Linda, <laughs> Uh, have any questions for Stephanie uh, before we wrap up the program? We'll just 
we'll sort of chill here. And if not, that's totally fine. We can. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I really want to say. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like it's a really good time for books about sex workers and particularly in the horror sphere. Like, I feel like the menu was is kind setting the stage people want more of this so hopefully mm -hmm. if you liked the menu you might like my book it's very different my book has a lot more romance in it um but i like the idea of like the romance being intertwined with the horror yeah um i'm not seeing any questions pop up but but no i agree i'm oh not a, not really i arrived a few minutes late so i'm going <laughs> to view the video later too stephanie what's the name of your memoir <laughs> Well, I mean, I never finished that. So the um, the the uh, chapbook version of it is going to be called My Dungeon Love Affair. Um, I when I was going to do it as a full memoir, it was called No One Here Can Save You, which I may I probably shouldn't have said that because I may save that and try to use that for something else. In fact, I was thinking about using that for my short story collection. Um, I just have to decide, yeah, whether I'm going to add more to it or not. Um, but yeah, so that was the memoir. <laughs> okay. Honestly, I like, I like, I think the chapbook is, captures the best of it. And I don't know that it needed to be like a full length memoir. So I'm kind of happy that it, it worked out the way it did. I think mm -hmm. sometimes I express things better through fiction and being able to add that like fantasy element, um, like with the ghosts and the horror, I think actually gets closer to true emotion sometimes. So. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, I definitely understand that. Um, so, uh, I guess that's the wrap on our on our program for this evening. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on and and talking all about sex and horror this yep. evening. Yeah, uh, and congratulations on the full, you know roster <laughs> oh yeah yeah this was a this was a really fun season um just really awesome people all around and great topics and um i'll i'll probably be putting together a few like best of uh moments from each video and uh making a separate video of that at some point and uh but yeah should be fun and this will go up on youtube probably right after we're done. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is my last question. Where can people find out more about you and your, uh, and your books? So I do have a website. I have not updated it yet with the priors. So, but I will. It's stephanieparent.net and it's S-T-E-P-H A-N-I-E and then parent like mom or dad, stephanieparent.net. Um, but for like very current up to date, Definitely Twitter is probably the number one. That's capital S, capital C, underscore, capital P, A-R-E-N-T. But also, I think if you Google my name, it just comes up. Um, and then Instagram, I usually try to post almost everything that was on Twitter to Instagram, and I do more pictures on Instagram, too. But it's basically all the same stuff. <laughs> I don't really post on Facebook anymore, um, but I am on there. I may try to, try to revamp that or boost that up as <laughs> the book comes closer to the release. Um, yeah, I think those are the main places. Cool. All right. Um, Claire, Claire, um, Smith, Claire L. Smith, who did the, the cover for the Briar, she made a book trailer for me. So Ooh. I think I'm probably going to have it like probably reveal it on April 9th, because that will be like exactly a month before the book comes out. So it's okay. a pretty cool trailer, so I'm excited about that. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so everybody be on the lookout April 9th for a trailer for the Briars. Um, and then May 9th. Yeah. Will be the Terry <laughs> Gates, if you follow their social media, they just I think posted that they've got a whole bunch of copies available for review, including oh, cool. so if you do want to read it earlier, if you think you're gonna review it, um, you can ask them for a copy. So that would be cool too. Oh. All right. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I'm, I will buy, I'm done. I think uh -oh. I'll just buy the book. Um, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> my, my, I, have yours. I bought yours. I haven't read it yet. Oh, 
That's really nice. Thank you. No, I'm I'm like my list of books that I have to read before they come out at the moment is like ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I, but I or, or reviewing them or uh, it's yeah, blurbing and reviewing. Um, there's God, I think there's at least four or five, and <laughs> one of them is titanic in size so <laughs> you were gonna say it was titanic i was like there's no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um no i uh that would be something but uh <laughs> um titanic, no. back in like when the why like around the time of twilight and stuff there was a book that was like werewolves on the titanic what <laughs> yes <laughs> i think it was more of like a romance than a horror it might have had some horror in it oh too <laughs> Well, I have to find that now. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I'm going to make a note of that. Um, but thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, for this episode and this series of Winterviews. We will be back next January um, with a whole new roster of people and new subjects. Uh, if you missed any episodes, you can find all of them on my YouTube channel at Catherine Silva Author. So go there, get educated on horror genres, and uh, and have a blast. And um, have a good night. Thank you.